Uh, welcome board members and members of the public. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Logan Pitts, the chair of the Board of Community Services. Uh, we have our new vice chair, Paul Castillo, uh, board members Guido Boca Leone, Omar Lopez, Carolina Spence, and Carol Quant in attendance today. Uh, <laughs> that's okay. Um, uh, our meeting hosts today are Julie Guzzi, Amy Hennessy, and Shelley McClure. Uh, the host will coordinate comments from the public and assist during the meeting and take notes for any follow-up needs. Uh, as a reminder to all present, please silence your phones. And if you're phoning in to join the meeting and you choose to speak during public comments uh, portion of the agenda, for privacy concerns, uh, the host will rename you to caller and only show the last four digits of your number. And additionally, the City of Santa Rosa is committed to providing a safe and inclusive environment free from disruption will not tolerate hateful speech or actions. Everyone is expected to participate respectfully, or if necessary, the meeting will end immediately. Um, we also have board member Cruz. Uh, excuse me, yes, board member Cruz. Um, thank you for joining us. And uh, Madam, uh, Madam Host, will you please explain how the public comments will be heard at today's meeting? Thank you, Chair Pitts. If you are attending in person, there are cards located at the entrance. Please complete the card and place it in the basket. You will be called up by name when your item number has been discussed and open to public comment. You will be asked to approach the podium and state your name for the record. After an agenda item has been presented, the chair will ask the board members for their comments or questions and then immediately following, the item will be open for public comments. If virtual hands are raised on Zoom prior to public comment, the host will lower all hands until the public comment item is open to all. Once the chair has called for public comment, those in person may raise their hand and wait to be called to the podium. Those on Zoom may raise their virtual hand. Those joining by phone may dial star nine to raise their hand. The host will then call on those in person first, then those who have raised their hands virtually in the order they appear on the screen. All public comments will be heard until there are no more hands raised in person or virtually. Each public comment is limited to three minutes and a courtesy timer will appear on the screen. Any email comments that were received by the deadline will have been included and uploaded to the agenda prior to the start of today's meeting. Emails received are not read into the record. Thank you. With that, I call this April 26, 2023 meeting of the Board of Community Services to order at 4.05 p.m. That wasn't very loud, we'll do that again. There we go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> welcome to our return to in-person meetings. Uh, welcome to being back. This new format is integrated with members of the public via Zoom. Members of the public who are using Zoom may view and listen to the meeting as noted on the city's website and on the agenda. Host, uh, may we have a roll call, please? Please respond when I call your name. Chair Pitts. Here. Vice Chair Castillo. Here. Board Member Boccalioni? Here. Board Member Cruz? Here. Board Member Lopez? Here. Board Member Spence? Here. Board Member Quant? Here. Let the record reflect that all board members are present. All right, good to see a full house. Um, so I'd like to open agenda matters. This is the time when any person may address our board on matters not listed on this agenda, but are within the subject matter of the jurisdiction of the Board of Community Services. Do we have any public comments? Yes, sir. Please step forward. Thank you. Is there a microphone I have to use? Well, the microphones are in the room. You're fine. Right here in the center. Yeah. Nice. All right. My name is Dwayne DeWitt. I'm from Roseland. And I wanted to thank you for opening the meetings back up and letting public participation occur in person. To me, that's a very important aspect of trying to get the voice of Roseland in the decision-making process. You folks probably didn't know it, but on Saturday, Earth Day, before you were downtown, we had over 20 community members come to what we call the Roseland Neighborhood. Now, the Roseland Neighborhood has been there for probably a century, but it's only been about 25 years we've been trying to save it from development. And basically, we were able to get the mayor of Santa Rosa, Natalie Rogers, and our district representative, Eddie Alvarez, to be there. When they said it would just be for a few moments, they liked the area so much they stayed for two hours. 
they were there walking through, seeing all this nature we've been saving, and then also seeing our community members coming and picking up debris that gets left by some of those folks that move through and aren't as attentive to nature as we are. Now, one of the things that's really important to keep in mind is that neighborhood groups, one called Roseland Action, got started 30 years ago working to save this area and its nature along the Roseland Creek Riparian Corridor. It's something that no city staff at the time ever was supportive of, and they were never supportive in two, until 2008 when the economic downturn occurred. And when that happened, one of the speculative land developers who had land on the south side of Roseland Creek was in a bind, and he needed to get some money quick to keep his business afloat. It's called Skellinger Brothers. And so they reached out to a Santa Rosa employee at the time, and they worked up something with what's called the Agricultural Preservation and Open Space District. And they got what's called a bailout. They basically were able to sell their property, which was only worth about $450,000 at the time, for close to $2.5 million for 5.9 acres. Now that land that was first purchased was told to the community that we had to have it. We had only been working on keeping the land to the north of the creek, but we were brought into a meeting with city council member Gary Waisaki and the parks director at that time who left under a cloud afterwards that you had to have that property to the south along the creek because that's where this bike path was going to go. And we've been talking about that since 2004 with the Roseland Creek concept plan that was put together with the community from 2003, 2004, the city adopted it. They said, yeah, we got it, $100,000. We've been sitting on it ever since. So I'm bringing this forward to you so that you folks can look into this and see the history of what we're working on out there because we call it a neighborhood park and a preserve. What happened next was the property owner to the north of what we were trying to save, they got bailed out. They were called cobblestone homes. And Ag and Open Space District came forward because Exchange Bank was calling in the note. And so Exchange Bank worked with them to get a tax deduction, put forward money. Altogether, $4.1 million was put into saving this land there. And a conservation easement was put in place. And basically it was like, hey, this is a preserve to the north. You got to keep it nice. And then to the south, you can talk about some things that are going to go on. Keep it all in mind. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment. Uh, do we have any other public comments? We have no hands raised at this time. Thank you. Uh, the next item is item four, the approval of the minutes. Are there any edits or corrections to the minutes of March 22nd, 2023? Seeing no hands, we'll accept uh, those as submitted. And on to item five, Deputy Director Santos. Hello. Please give your report on upcoming and accomplished events. Thank you, Chair Pitts and board members. Uh, we're gonna try this model tonight, see if it works uh, works well. So folks at um, virtual and here can see and hear everything. So um, the deputy director updates for, I wanted to um, let you all know, you saw a new name tonight on the folks helping us behind the scenes, Amy Hennessy. So I'm really pleased to let you know we uh, brought her on from the public works team uh, and she's our new admin tech over for uh, Parks and Rec. And she replaced, for those of you who knew Elisa Rawson previously, she replaced that position. So we're super excited. We've had her on board for about a month and she's helping out tonight. So welcome to Amy. And also on that note, uh, a big thank you to all of our administrative professionals in Rec and Parks and throughout the city. Today, today is Administrative Professionals Day. Um, so we have a big celebration and um, thank you to our admin team today. And then also wanted to update you, we've been talking about the ordinances related to the Board of Community Services. Wanted to give you a little update on that. We have met with the city attorney's office and the city clerk's office, and we'll be um, circling with the city manager's office soon, but we'll be bring, we plan to bring back the discussion about when this meeting should start at our next board meeting. Um, in May. So keep that in mind. We'd like to come back and have you think about and discuss what time you'd like to to meet. And we'll talk about the 
what other boards are doing and what other folks are doing in our community and any constraints and opportunities there with the timing. Um, I also just want a little reminder, I think I mentioned this last time, but I wanted to say that we'll be bringing the Art and Public Places Committee to have a, a, the staff member representing Art and Public Places Committee come and uh, speak with the board in June. So um, I know there's some interest in how art uh, goes on in the city and how it comes to our park. So that's a really good opportunity to ask your questions there. And uh, I want to thank our park maintenance team for really getting to all the weeds out there in the city. I'm sure you've seen them. It was a really rainy season. So we have tons and tons of weeds. And so we have a really extensive schedule with our very small team we have. We previously used to have a landscape contractor who would do a lot of this and right now, we don't have that landscape contract, but we'll be going forward in the future to ask council for that, those funds to do that. So right now we have 20 something folks out there doing all the regular things they need to do, plus all the weeding, weeding in the roadway landscapings and throughout the park. So many thanks to them. Um, I also wanna let you know the city is doing a citywide classification study for all staff throughout the city, including uh, rec and parks and so it's taking us a bit of time but what that is it's looking at our positions um, and how they correlate to other similar positions throughout um, the state and other organizations our size it's a really great opportunity for the city to do this and really look at the core of what we do as it relates to our job descriptions and is the funding there as well so that's that's ongoing and uh, I'm not sure about the entire citywide, but we are all supposed to have our stuff in on Monday for those staff that are here <laughs> as a reminder. And then um, we will be at council on May 23rd for public works proclamation uh, for our park maintenance staff as a recognition for all the work they do uh, throughout the community, not just in Reckon Park, since we'll be honoring um, some of our staff members with a proclamation on May 23rd. Um, our regular budget for the entire city is going on May 9th and 10th to council. The parks and recreation budget will be on May 10th, the second day. And we will be after fire, police and planning and economic development departments and then rec and parks will go uh, and talk about our um, budget. And um, on a Happy and sad note, I did want to mention we do have a retirement coming up. Sorry. <laughs> um, our aquatics professional here, rec supervisor extraordinaire for aquatics will be retiring this summer. We are very sad to see him go, but so happy for his retirement to come up this summer. Yay. I wanted to mention that. Yes. <laughs> The other thing, just a couple more things, I wanted to mention that we have um, employee recognition for employees that over 10 years service, um, as well as five years service um, this Thursday. Um, and I wanted to mention that we have our rec supervisor, Amy Rockowitz, has been with the city for 30 years. Don Hicks, 25 years. Uh, Mickey Ritt, well, probably more than that. This is a recognition for a couple years ago, yeah. Mickey Remmer, Remy, our rec coordinator, 25 years. Jean Pugh, our rec coordinator, 20 years. And Preston Schubert, our maintenance worker, 15 years. And our own recreation deputy director, Jeff Tivitz, 15 years. So uh, I'll mention that we have some other folks that we uh, that are five years and under. I'll bring those up for our next meeting. But just wanted to let you know some of that recognition going on out there. And that's the end of my report. Thank you, Director Santos. Uh, are there any questions from the board? Um, well, congratulations to all those employees on those landmarks and congrats on the retirement. And also, um, Amy, if you're out there somewhere, welcome. It's good to have you on the team. So, thanks again. Chair sure, Pitts, I'd like to make a comment on this. Go ahead, Dwayne. Dwayne DeWitt from Roseland. The director mentioned that there's going to be a discussion about when meeting times would be. Uh, I think it's really important <clears throat> that you get some public input about when the public might be able to attend better than these four o'clock meetings. These have been something that in the past, hopefully more citizens would like to come to. Typically they get off work about 530. So I would advocate that you reach out, perhaps survey through the community when they might be able to attend the board of community services meetings better. And then congratulations to the park staff. 
the maintenance people do such a good job. It's good they get a proclamation, and I'll be clapping for them on the 23rd. Thank God. I always put in during budget hearings that you folks should get more money for more workers at the bottom level. No offense to top folks, but down at the bottom are the ones that cut the grass and make things nice in our parks. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment now and in the future. Um, we will move on then to number seven. These are our uh, board member reports. Um, and uh, we I just have a note here that we did get that packet from our planning staff that has the different boards, committees, and commissions. Um, you can follow up with the staff about that. Um, and then there were some other, other information in there um, on the current parks projects. So take a look at that. Shelly sent that around just as a reminder. Um, but we'll go down the line if you have a report. Uh, um, do you have a report? Uh, sure. So um, I, I stopped by um, Coffee Park since our last meeting. Um, but moving forward, I can't remember the other little park I was at, um, Fulton area. Um, I don't, I can't remember, I'm sorry. Um, but moving forward um, on the 6th, um, I'm organizing a small um, silent march in regards to missing murdered indigenous women. And um, that's on my Facebook and I will email it out. Thank you. And you guys are all welcome. You guys do. <laughs> Thank you for the report. Board member Vocalioni, do you have a report from this month? Uh, yes, I'd like to make a couple of comments on uh, our Southwest Community Park. Uh, it's in my area, and uh, the construction of that big moat uh, apartment building there on the corner of, of uh, Old Stony Point and Hearn is going to be completed next month. And it's probably going to, it's 154 units. If there's one child to each one of those units, that's 154 more kids on bicycles and so on. And again, we need to have a, a sidewalk down on the north side of West Turn Avenue to the park. Uh, there is no sidewalk on that side. So they're going to be walking in the dirt and mud or, or whatever. And they'll be trying to cross the street, running across it could end up with problems there. So I really think that that needs to be done. And again, uh, I haven't had any comment back on the lighting. There's no lights at that park. That should have be there at least until nine o'clock because the Hispanic people, they when they get off work, they're there with their kids and having dinner and, and barbecuing and the place is bombed every night practically. So I really think we should get some lighting in there to uh, and the city, our city bus also goes in and makes a loop around and there's no light where people get off just in case there's other things that shouldn't be going on are going on there so i think for the protection that we should uh, really get that going again get that going right. otherwise everything in the park is great great thank you for your report board member spence do you have a report uh, yes, I went to Coffee Park also. Didn't see you there. Uh, but I haven't been there in a long time. And it looks wonderful. And the feeling of it is such a neighborhood park feel. It really, really felt good. So I encourage you, if you've not seen it now, please go. It just looks great. The neighborhood has totally embraced it. And that's all. I'm not going to say anything about marriage Okay. <laughs> you, got, you got a few more months for a month. Yeah, I know. I'm getting kind of tired. <laughs> Thank you. Board Member Lopez, do you have a report? It looks like we all went to Coffee Park. <laughs> I, okay. I got to spend some time there with some friends. It's like everybody has said, it's a really wonderful park. Um, it's been beautifully redone. So if you have not been there, please go there. Uh, besides that, I'm really excited to see this warm weather, more time outside. Nice. Thank you. Board Member Kwan, do you have a report? I do. And please remember, I'm retired, so I have lots of time to do this stuff. I was able to participate in the Franklin Park Park a Month cleanup along with Board Member Cruz. I forgot about that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I uh, was also fortunate enough to participate 
in a long planned and often rescheduled tour of the rural cemetery with Mayor Rogers and city manager Smith, neither one of whom had been there before and both of whom were wonderfully amazed and um, stunned by this jewel in our park system. I'm also currently taking a course in the Finley Senior Center, and I'd like to report that the air conditioning works all too well, <laughs> and it is quite the joy to have um, those classes and other resources available for rent to the public. Um, this is quite the resource for the community as a whole, and kudos to Park and Rec for sponsoring this building for community use. I also happen by a very well organized and attend bocce ball session at Juilliard Park last Friday night. What a joy, what a low maintenance community oriented sports activity that we sponsor and um, that the community helps take care of. So that was wonderful. I'd also like to mention that we had 30 plus volunteers at our rural cemetery cleanup on the third Saturday. It always blows our mind when this many people show up. The students getting their community um, hours and the parents that they bring with them and the joy and the wonder that they also bring is um, quite something. And I also spent uh, a couple hours at an Earth Day booth. Mm -hmm. Busy, all right, as promised. It, it comes with retirement if you play your cards wrong. <laughs> All right. Thank you for the report. Um, board member Castillo. Uh, Excuse me, Vice Chair Castillo. <laughs> uh, a few items. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to apologize to staff for last meeting. I feel like we grilled them a bit regarding permits for uh, food workers and things of that nature. And speaking with staff afterwards, Parks and Rec essentially have nothing to do with that. Um, so <laughs> since we are not an enforcement vehicle, uh, I think that's great and we shouldn't be. If the county wants to enforce that, you know, that's on them. But as far as us just being a facilitator and a, and a place where people can gather, I'm, I'm all for that and we should stick to that. Uh, parks that I went to, I actually went to a small park called Strawberry Park. I've never been there before. Very nice little park. And other than that, I'd also like to thank the, the gentleman that spoke, Dwayne. It's great to have public comment and people in person here, so I, I really appreciate that. Pleasure is mine, sir. Thank you. Yeah. That's, that's all I got. Thank you for your report. Um, my report from this month is, is pretty brief. I'm sorry I missed the park cleanup. Um, I'm sure that was a good one, uh, and that's a well-loved park, so it, it probably always needs, needs some help. But. Um, Glad that folks were out there for that. Um, my only real report from the month is in my quest to visit every park. My new park of the month was Bicentennial Park, where I had lunch today. And uh, not many folks in the middle of the day, but the park was looking pretty good. Um, so good job to the, the maintenance crews on that. And that's it for me for the month. And Chair Pitts, can we back up to item five for accomplish and upcoming events as well? I think we breezed over that a bit, so I just want to. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I thought that I thought you sort of did that as two different as one. Yep, I apologize. I'd like to go ahead and. Um, sure. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to give a brief update on upcoming and accomplishments. You have your long list, which I will not go over. All those are amazing things. Uh, but I wanted to talk about our other train. We talk about Howard Park train all the time, but I wanted to mention the Redwood Empire live steamers at Youth Park. It's a really cute little train. If you haven't been there, that maybe that's your park next month to go check out. They uh, start operating the first weekend of every month through October, and a $1 donation uh, is appreciated. And then also I wanted to chime in on board member Quant's uh, attendance at our Earth Day Festival at Courthouse Square. It was extremely well attended. It was very, very busy, really hot day, um, but we're super excited to have uh, the Recreation and Parks team there. Um, and we got a lot, I think we had a lot of uh, folks interested in volunteering and signing up for programs. So really great event among many on the list. End of report. Great, thank you. Um, and we also had a request for a public comment on item seven. Thank you, sir. It's wonderful to hear Mr. 
Bacalioni? Bacalioni. Bacalioni. Mouth of a lion. Nice. We got it going, sir. I'm glad you spoke about Hearn Avenue. Essentially, for decades, we've been asking that the city would put in sidewalks on both sides of Hearn Avenue, all the way from Highway 101 out to Stony Point Road. I served on an elected commission and uh, was a project area committee, excuse me, for uh, Southwest Santa Rosa Redevelopment in the years 2000 to 2004. And we had talked about this 30 full years ago when the Southwest Area Plan came forward that there would be sidewalks on both sides of Hearn Avenue so there would be safety. And now that you've pointed out so many more children will be coming in, this is vitally important. Then I just wanted to mention one other thing, Mr. Castillo, you had mentioned Strawberry Park. Did you know that there's been a report written by a graduate student at the University of California Landscape Architecture Department on creekscaping for kids that was done for Santa Rosa for Strawberry Park and Strawberry School nearby? So you should look into that. Yeah, I think you'd really like it, creekscaping for kids. And thank you, Mr. Pitts, for all you're doing. Bicentennial Park's a good place to just hang out. And you only need a half court basketball court, they say, but you know, if you put in a full size, full basketball court, you get far more kids out there playing. They really like it. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. There was one solo basketball player today. <laughs> May I ask um, a uh, question of clarification? Sure. Um, could you tell me the sidewalks under discussion, would that be part of the purview of this committee? Uh, those are under development review. So staff do review those plans and um, we have information on that. If you'd like to hear it, we can bring up our there he is, Park Planner Scott Wilkinson, to give a little bit of an update if you so choose, Chair Pitts, uh, on those developments. But we do review those, so they don't necessarily come here, but it's under staff's purview to review the development uh, plans that come through for any development. And we review it for any impacts to parks. We don't necessarily review it for you know, sidewalk compliance, that's not parks, but um, we have provided information. We'll provide information so it's really clear at the next director update for everybody. So everyone can hear it. Scott, if you could. Or if, or if Scott would like to give a little bit of information. Sorry to put you on the spot, but if you would like to uh, provide sure. any. A, a little nugget or two. Uh, yeah. I can also come back next month. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, that's great. Yeah. I'm here now. I can come back again. Uh, to your point, uh, board member. Boclioni, um, I believe the the um, development you're you're talking about. We did see mm -hmm. it. Uh, we did review it. Uh, we did look um, and inquire in some detail with the planner who was reviewing uh, the project at planning and economic development to find out that they are building sidewalk in fr on their frontages. Um, unfortunately, only a small frontage of that project actually does contact Hearn Avenue. And I'm, I'm blanking on the street to the uh, west that it most Old Stony Point Road. Road. Old Stony Old Point Road. Road. And yeah, that's the only place where they're where they're committed to, to put a sidewalk, but not on her. Well, there's just this, like I said, just a short. I believe there's either an ingress or an egress or both driveway there, and there's so there's a tiny bit there. But um, interestingly, there is also a easement going through between two homes that front on on on. Um, there and they're creating a pathway from the project to Hearn and then a crossing, an improved crossing there to the other side of Hearn where there is a sidewalk, I believe. So that's sort of their strategy um, from what I could gather in, in, in my review of the project. That's what I can offer. Great. Thank you. If you have more information next month, that's what we can bring some more. Great. Were there any other questions from the board? Okay. We will move on to uh, 8.1, the aquatics overview. Uh, we have a recreation supervisor already mentioned, John Hicks, and he'll provide an update on the status of the program. So I have a PowerPoint presentation I'd like to share with you, but uh, uh, Chair Pitts and uh, Vice Chair Castillo and board members, it's such a pleasure to be here. I've had the pleasure to uh, meet many board members over the years and uh, and uh, share information about some of my passions here with my job. And that's, uh, we'll be about including some temp years, we'd be uh, 28 years with uh, 
with the city. And uh, my main responsibility during those years is, has been the aquatic facilities. So um, I'm pretty passionate about aquatics and, uh, and uh, water safety. Um, you know, I've been trying to find a, uh, a surgeon that will surgically implant a USB port so I can sort of download some of that institutional knowledge that's up here. <laughs> Fortunately, I have a really good staff team. Uh, part of them are here today that I just wanted to introduce to you because uh, even though I'm leaving, uh, this, the aquatics is going to be in very good hands. Um, so I'd like to introduce Gria up at the back. She's our uh, coordinator at Finley Aquatic Centre and that's uh, very appropriate that she's wearing one of our water safety shirts that says drowning is preventable and on the back it says uh, water safety is no accident. Is no accident. <laughs> and we're passionate about that and actually the month of May is water safety month so we're going to be sort of educating more on water safety which is so important in our community so thanks for wearing that shirt. And over here is Brandon Hammond who's the, is our coordinator at uh, the Ridgeway Swim Centre uh, and then we also have Joel Strass, who's uh, one of our recreation specialists. We've actually got a vacancy at one of our recreation specialists that we're hoping to fill soon. So um, just want to mention that they are truly aquatic professionals and they make uh, the city look good. They make me look good all the time. They've got quite an array of uh, qualifications and experience. Uh, I know Brandon has had you know, a couple of years in CPRS uh, management school and he is a CPO, a certified pool operator and um, he's a lifeguard and a lifeguard instructor. In fact, all three are lifeguard instructors. So, and actually all three are CPO certified pool operators as well. So, so they have, uh, you know, the industry standards and qualifications to operate our big uh, aquatic centers. So uh, the place is gonna be in good hands. So each time I come, we try to give you a little update on, on aquatics. And I know we have some new board members here since I was here last. And, and I want you to know we have scheduled your swim, you know, your, your swim test. So I expect no. Awesome. Right after the meeting. Oh, <laughs> nice. Uh, but uh, sometimes I've talked about programs and everything we do and how much money we bring in and how many people we serve uh, because we are very busy facilities. When I connect with some of my colleagues in the industry, they go, what, how many people do you have come to those facilities? And, what? How much money are you bringing in each year? Because we bring in about just over a million dollars a year in aquatics between the two, two facilities. So we are busy and some communities in California have pools that are closed seasonally. We have such a demand for aquatics that both of our facilities are open year round without closing. Uh, so we are very, very busy. In fact, uh, all of our swim lessons right now are all full pretty much with waiting lists to get in. So we desperately need more pool space. A lot of cities our size have three or four facilities. We only have two and we're in a community where not one high school has a swimming pool, which is very unusual for a community. So we are busy in aquatics. So that just, and there's a whole variety of, of programs. Some of the unique ones, we still have some water polo, swim lessons is huge. We have lap swim, um, we have recreation swim, which is our family swim time. We have water fitness classes, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, but today I wanted to just share with you that uh, our, our aquatic centers, do I sort of give you a little nod when I want the next slide? Just say next slide. Next slide, please. <laughs> um, our aquatic centers are not your typical backyard pools. And I'd be glad to give any of you a tour of our mechanical room anytime, because people come into that go, oh my gosh, they can't believe the mechanical room, the, the millions of dollars of equipment and filters and things we have. Next slide, please. And so um, at Finley, we have a micro turbine uh, generator. There's a natural gas generator it was placed in the mechanical room there. It, it generates electricity for this park and for this facility, but doesn't it create all the electricity. It was uh, engineered to be the right size to offset tiered billing that was we had big tiered billings in our in our utility bills and so it brought those expenses down but it's located in our mechanical room because we capture the waste which is the heat and we use that heat to off, offset our heating bill and when it was introduced into the building over there it was estimated it could save us fifty to sixty thousand dollars a year in energy costs so that's just one piece of technology we have in there that's helping with utility costs um, for our city. Next slide, please. 
This is uh, an example of one of our old heaters, a Teledyne Lars pool heater, big heater uh, with a copper heat exchanger. It's only about 65% efficient and, and um, air quality enforcement says, you know, we've got to have plans to get rid of that. Well, we had a bigger one for our main pool and we have recently got rid of that and put in a new, this new heater. So that's what the old heaters used to, the 30 year old heater right there is not very efficient and not very good for our air quality. So ne next slide, please. So we've put in a new Lockenbach Aquas commercial pool condensing boiler, and it's up to 97, 98% efficient. It captures all the heat. And then our air quality inspectors that come in and go, yes, you know, this is meeting our NOx standards, um, you know, that we, ha we have to meet for air quality. So we're excited about that heater. Uh, it's more efficient. It doesn't break down as much as the old one. And so that was a good project that came in to help us uh, save energy and help our air quality. Next slide, please. And here's just one example. These are just the sand filters we have just for the uh, training pool at this facility. We have a bank of filters for the second pool and also big filters over at the Ridgeway Swim Center. And these are high rates, rapid sand filters that filter our water to make them uh, uh, the water crystal clear. Uh, these are EPD filters. They're manufactured by a company that, that makes filters for um, uh, water, you know, for drinking water as well. Um, so they do a really good job at filtering the water and making it crystal clear. Uh, pool, the main pool here is 350,000 gallons of water that goes through, goes through those filters alone uh, just at the training pool. So that's just an, an idea of the size of uh, a filtration system there for just one pool. Next slide, please. This is a Beck System 7 commercial pool chemical controller. I call it the brains because it has probes in there that's uh, testing the water continually. It has set points in there. And so if the, if the chlorine, sanitizing chlorine gets uh, too low, it automatically tells a pump to come on to feed that chlorine up to a certain set point that switches off. It has a probe in there that's testing the pH uh, in there. And if the pH is off, it'll send a, send a signal to our uh, CO2 pump to switch on because we manage pH with the uh, carbon dioxide. And we also manage the pH with uh, muriatic acid. So it, it, it monitors constantly and will send signals to switch on or switch off um, all these different things, including our heater. It has uh, sensors, sensors in there. So I call it the brains that's operating that it it can normally operate uh, continually by itself without oversight, but we also have oversight and we have to do a daily log per uh, county health standards. And sometimes that um, if the probe isn't working or there's a, uh, an issue with a, with, a, with a sensor or a in chemical injectors, it will send an alarm out. It has the ability to send alarms out uh, remotely uh, through an email and an operator can we don't have it fully functional right now, but it can send out a message where operators can make adjustments and changes remotely. Uh, so that's, that's good to have those spec seven controllers that make it easier for our maintenance team. Next slide, please. We have high efficient pumps and motors. Um, I am exploring possibly some, some variable speed pumps to, to add to these, but they are high efficient motors. Uh, which helps us on our utility expenses, but they are, they don't look very big there, but uh, just that, that blue one you see there is probably about, when we had to change that out with the pump and motor was over 600 pounds. So it was sort of, we had to have pulleys and chains and everything to lift it out of the pit and get it onto a truck and switch it out. And we had to switch that out. So uh, sizable pumps and motors there. Next slide, please. So this is our Ultramax. It's a. Uh, it, it's hard to tell how big that is in that picture, but it's our. It's our robot vacuum cleaner. It gets lowered into the pool, and it robotically cleans our pool without having to have a uh, maintenance person, you know, <laughs> going through the whole pool. And uh, um, so it can uh, be set to run in there, and uh, it does a really good job of vacuuming vacuuming our pools. So we're lucky to have a robot vacuum cleaner at each facility uh, vacuuming our pools. Next slide, please. 
This is a chlorine generator. Um, we have the sanitizer we use for both pools is chlorine. At Finley, we get bulk liquid chlorine delivered because we have the infrastructure and the space to put in a secondary containment that meets all the hazmat standards. Um, for containment if there was a catastrophic leak. And so we get liquid chlorine delivered here because we have that ability. Uh, over at Ridgeway, uh, Ridgeway, the original Ridgeway that was built in 1958, um, originally had chlorine gas as a sanitizer. Great sanitizer, very dangerous, like mustard gas. And so when we did renovations over there, our fire department said, no more chlorine gas, it's too dangerous. And so we didn't have the room in our mechanical room area to put the infrastructure for a secondary containment tank for having liquid chlorine at, at the concentration we get here. So we had to come up with a different plan. So we put in a chlorine generator. And so that actually, we had to actually manufacture chlorine at that pool over there. We have a brine tank that has salt in it. Water flows through that into the chlorine generator. The chlorine molecule is broken up, it vents off a little hydrogen and it produces sodium hypochlorite, which is chlorine, but it produces it at a lower concentration. So we do have a storage tank over there that, that stores that lower concentration of chlorine that's fed quickly into the pool. And because it's that lower concentration, we don't have to meet all the hazardous materials protocols for full strength chlorine. So, and we're just in the process of putting in a brand new one over there, the old one reached its life expectancy. And so um, we were able to put in a brand new chlorine generator over there that's being installed as we speak. So I'm excited about that. That'll help with the sanitizing. And it's interesting, people will say, do you have a salt pool? And I say, well, all chlorine, whether you get it from the big tanker truck or not, is, is made from chlorine. The chlorine, we, and it's made from salt. The, the chlorine we get here is manufactured at a factory somewhere else, has some additives and preservatives in it, but you know, we're basically manufacturing our own chlorine over at Ridgeway. I mean, you hear some backyard pools that are salt pools and you broadcast salt into your backyard pool well, it, through the filtration system. It's still breaking up that salt molecule and creating chlorine even in your backyard pool. Uh, but it does, Ridgeway does have a little bit of difference in taste and texture um, than this pool over here. I think it might be the added additives and preservatives. So, so Really, any pool that has chlorine is technically a salt pool because that's what chlorine is made out of. So um, anyway, there's sort of a little interesting chemistry there about uh, chlorine. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we have pool covers and we have the highest standard in industry standards of pool covers. And this is part of our energy saving program. You know, uh, I, I joke with the staff when I come in the mornings, especially the winter mornings, and I see that steam coming off the pool on it, and I go, well, that's not steam, that's a dollar signs, um, because uh, that's a lot of energy we're losing. And so these covers save us thousands and thousands of dollars every year in energy costs by using the, you know, these are the, you can get different grade quality pool covers. These are the highest grades you can get, and it, it is a big energy saver for us. So we're serious about saving energy when we can. Next slide, please. So at a previous presentation, we talked about the new exciting project that's going to go on over here at Finley that's uh, going to go out to, to bid soon. Yes. <laughs> we have two others that <laughs> I'm on the team with. And, uh, and we're so excited about this. Um, it's going to add a fun new element to the Finley Aquatic Centre that's, that's different than Ridgeway. And so just a little update. It's coming in 2024. <laughs> uh, it's going out to bid this month. <laughs> or next. Ish. Uh, under construction in September of this year, ish. Uh, and it'll be opening in the spring of 2024. Is there anything I missed? Good highlights. Those good, are the highlights. Good highlights, good. I'm looking at these guys because uh, uh, they're. <clears throat> On the on the uh, production side of it, and the and uh, I, I was trying to plan my retirement to be around during the construction, but uh, I was around to help with uh, some of the plans and design work. But I know it's going to be in, in good good hands uh, um, when I'm gone through the construction phase, and then it's going to be in really good hands to operate by the staff that are here. So that's exciting. And then just flicking through the next few slides, these are just some of the pictures, artist renderings of what it might look like. I know I showed these before at a previous meeting, but 
Uh, it's going to be fun activities for the kids. At Ridgeway, we have the slide. You have to be a certain height to go on the slide. And so it's for older kids. This is going to be so great for the young families with little kids and toddlers. And it's going to really revitalize our um, birthday party, pool rental, uh, bring in some more money over at, uh, over at the facility next door here. So, um, And then so while we're closed with construction, uh, I've been working closely with staff, especially Brandon here over at Ridgeway, because we're going to try and move as much as we can over to Ridgeway while Finley's closed for construction because uh, it's going to be closed September, October, November, December, January, February, rain, rain delays, we're not sure, you know, it's not, not going to be any rain this year, that's right. But, um, and, uh, and so we're trying to move as much as we can over to Ridgeway. Uh, we will be adjusting, adding some extra times to lap swim. Um, we haven't had lap swim early morning, at, you know, six in the morning, we'll be over at Ridgeway. We're going to be moving our fall swim lessons over there this year. Um, we did move, um, Masters also, the Masters has moved to the junior college and it's, is with the Neptune swim team that also swims at the junior college, New Pool. And there's still conversation going on with them, but I think we're going to be able to accommodate most of our programming over at Ridgeway, that's the plan. So we'll have lap swim over there. That might be a little busier. We'll be moving some water fitness classes over there. We're going to be moving swim lessons over there for the, um, the fall. Um, we won't be able to accommodate everyone over there, but uh, we are going to try and expand some lap swim hours as well in the early afternoon and maybe in, and into the evening as well, which are not currently over at, over at Ridgeway. So, that is our plan to hopefully come. And then we keep the two pools from slightly different temperature. Uh, Ridgeway is our more competitive pool and competitive swimmers like to have the water temperature at 79, 80, 81. And the little kids and the water fitness classes like to have it at 105. No, I'm sorry, I <laughs> always want it warmer. They like to have it warmer. So we keep this pool, you know, 83, 84. So we're going to try and compromise and have, you know, 82-ish temperature over at Ridgeway when we move programming over there. So it's a bit of a juggle. I know there'll be people saying they want it cooler and some that want it warmer. And we will educate to try and make sure everyone is uh, understanding the reason and uh, accommodating everyone's needs. So challenges we might be working on in the future. Uh, we have a 22 year old water slide that we have a fantastic maintenance staff that they are experts in repairing fiberglass gel coat on the on the slide flumes they're expert at fixing concrete and and all sorts of things but with you know with pools and chlorine there's always rust and 22 years is showing some signs on our uh, pool stairs and landings and been talking with uh, contractors and manufacturer of the slide to see if we can come up with a solution to repair uh, and extend the life of our slide over there. So that's a challenge we're working on right now uh, into next year. Uh, both pools uh, are need of some plaster repair and it's pretty expensive to replaster a whole huge pool. So we'll be looking at uh, plans to uh, repair patch where we can and then plan for a replaster as needed in the next uh, number of years. And then um, concrete deck areas over at Ridgeway is showing some signs that at some point we'll have to plan either sections of that deck to be repaired. So they're the challenges for aquatics over the next four or five years that we're sort of working on right now. Is there anything that you wanted to add? No? The time, if there are any questions, I'd be glad to answer questions. All right, thanks, Don. But just a reminder to the board, this is the time for questions, and then we're gonna to go to our public comment, and then we can uh, have a discussion after that. So, go ahead, we Question, a couple of questions. Number one, I have a brain that operates my pool too, but if I have a headache one day, man, it gets out of control. <laughs> and I gotta remember, did I put that chlorine in, or did I? Uh, on the water, the water, uh, what are you calling those things that the kids stand underneath the water sprays down? On oh, the spray ground? Spray down, spray yeah, ground. the play features on the Where spray Where does that water go uh, from the ground? Okay. Uh, so in the past, there has been different, there's been a, the water 
sprays up and then goes to waste. In California, you're not allowed to have that type of system anymore. And, and there's some places that have had a spray ground where the water is captured in the tanks and then they, they use that for irrigation. But most of the spray grounds now are a recirculating system. They have to be. Uh, in fact, by county, by state code, health code, it, it has to be operated like a pool. And so part of the project is it's going to have a little mechanical room. And in that mechanical room is going to be filters and it's going to be sanitized twice. It's going to have a chlorine and a UV sanitizer for that water. And it'll even have a heater in there, but it, and it has an underground 4,500 gallon tank underground, which is like a pool. So it really has to be operated, filtered, sanitized, quality checked, uh, just like a swimming pool. Can that circulate go back into the pool for evaporation? It you know, like occurs in the swimming pool. So it, it'll have an automatic uh, fill line. Uh, if there is evaporation and spray out, it'll automatically fill that 4,500 gall gallon tank, just like any of our pools has the same system. It's an auto fill line that maintains the level in that underground tank, um, but it has to be operated like a pool and it will be fully inspected by County Health. Uh, County Health has been very much involved in our plans um, and my staff are all trained in how to operate that because we, we helped open and operate the one downtown here that has the same system. It's, it's operated like a pool, the one down at the uh, Prince Gateway Park uh, spray ground. Welcome. Any other questions? Uh, quick question regarding the slide maintenance. Uh, I, you noted that it's aging, it's 25 years at this point. Is there any sort of analysis, like at what point repairs are no longer worth it? A so, replacement is the answer. So we are governed by a state uh, um, amusement ride tramway division of the state, and we have a state inspector that comes out every year. They have to do a paperwork audit and inspection audit and operations audit every year. We just had that recently. Um, and on top of that, we've had to have a structural engineer inspect the slide every 10 years. So we've had two of those. The last 10 year, the guy goes, oh my gosh, this is 20 years old. Gosh, you guys are doing such a great job on your maintenance. You know, kudos to your maintenance team. So they've been very happy that it looks younger than what it is because we've had such good on-site maintenance all the time. Um, they say that a, a slide has a life expectancy of 25, 30, maybe pushing beyond that if you're lucky. So, so obviously repairing these stairs and landings, we hope to get. And so the inspector said, oh, you should easily get another 10 years okay. as long as we take care of those the slide and landings, not only the stairs and the landing. So yeah, it is, you know, we've governed pretty closely and get, have to meet high standards, especially this last inspector had. He's a new inspector and I'm going, oh my gosh. So yeah, we can meet all of those though. All right. Any other questions? Uh, I have, go ahead, Carol. Yeah. Don, thank you for your years of service. Um, going back to the slides, the state-of-the-art behind-the-scenes equipment, is that in place at both facilities? That is correct. Finley? That is correct. I, I was remiss in, sorry, Brandon, not taking some photos over at, over at Ridgeway. Uh, Ridgeway has the same sort of blue filters uh, over there. They have the same VEX-7 uh, chemical controller brain. Um, they have the same uh, chlorine-type feed system. They have the same... CO2, and so we have a, we get a delivery of liquid CO2, which is in that cryogenic tank, <laughs> uh, sort of, uh, and uh, so it has the same, but basically the same equipment. There's obviously a different configuration because of space constraints. And over at Ridgeway, it went through a design where the original Ridgeway was three pools, but it was all treated as one body of water. The, the code says for every body of water, you have to have a separate complete system. So when we redesigned that pool, you'll notice if you go to Ridgeway, it's one pool, it has a main lap pool and it's connected to the splash pool for the slide. And it was purposely designed that way so it would be one body of water. So we only had to have one filtration system and one heater and one, you know, because we didn't have the room because the mechanical room is under the bleachers. So so, uh, and that, so that means that Ridgeway, uh, Finley, 
we have two pool, we actually have three pools. One's not operational now, the little waiting pool where we're going to put the spray ground, but we currently have two pools. So in the mechanical room, you have two separate systems in the mechanical room because it's two bodies of water. When we get the spray ground, that'll be counted as a third body of water. So we'll have three, that's why there's going to be a little mechanical building. We'll have three operation systems because it'll be counted as three bodies of water. Great, next question. Um, is there much crossover of use by um, visitors or are there Finley pool users and Ridgeway users? And the follow-up question to that is, have you already begun the campaign to let the Finley users know that they're going to need to transfer to Ridgeway yeah. for a period our, of time? Our regulars absolutely know what's happening. Uh, you know, water fitness uh, participants and our regular, you know, obviously some of the people that are dropping in on you that, you know, we're going to be probably, we're going to be ramping that up when we, when we get the, we know exactly when the dates are, but uh, absolutely our, uh, being lots of questions. We have, we have information on our website. Um, so there is information that's readily available out there and, and there's been lots of questions. And you've got flyers posted like at the facilities or will- We don't quite have flyers and posters yet. We're still waiting on, waiting for it to go out to bed and then and then that'll determine exactly when that closure date will be, but we will be planning that real soon. Great, Spe speaking of the bid, Board of Community Services has been hearing about this upgrade for a couple years now. Are we on schedule? Are we a little behind and is this funded? <laughs> I, I can I can help with that. Um, we we made the decision last year to go ahead and do it to, to go ahead and move the project into this year. So it's delayed from when we first talked to you. But this we did plan this so that we could uh, have our swimmers prepared and ready, and that we could be in a better position uh, going into the fall and uh, reduce our chances of eating into the summer of the next year. So we, so we went ahead, so it's a little bit delayed, but it's on schedule the way we have worked it out um, and planned to go forward and it is completely funded. Excellent. Yes. Uh, last question, I just wanted to, yours. I wanted to add just on, onto that. I hate to delay things <laughs> and I wanted to be around for this, but it got to the point when we were planning it to start earlier, it was getting like, oh, we're still waiting on the county to get back there every month. And it was starting to go, oh my gosh, it's going to really have an effect on the spring and summer programming. Perhaps we should delay it to August so it doesn't affect the summer. And so hopefully the, it'll go into construction, it'll be complete, and it won't have an effect on any summer or, or busy springtime either. So that was the plan to delay it. And I think that's been important. That's been embraced by our customers. Oh, that's great that you did that so it wouldn't affect the, the big family swim time and swim lesson times and you know that sort of stuff so uh, great and uh wise move on your parts and i'm thrilled to hear that it's already funded uh last question probably not yours but someone already mentioned um prince um splash pad is it turned on yet or will it be on this weekend no <laughs> No. I'll defer to our partner. <laughs> and it will be May when we go. Thank you. It's hard to plan those openings when you, it's, we have the same issue with the pools. It's like, it's going to be 80 degrees this week. Well, I, my crystal ball didn't tell me that to be able to plan all my stuff and plan this and plan that. So sometimes these, these openings, especially if you have unseasonal warm weather that comes early, is like, it can be disappointing for people. but. This time last year was not like that, the weather. So, so I haven't been able to get my crystal ball to work quite right yet on those things. So. Thank you, Don. You're welcome. Thanks, Carol. Uh, Don, so will the whole pool complex be closed during the construction? It will, um, because part of the, part of it's a 30 year old facility and part of the, the concrete deck area is failing and is becoming a bit of a safety issue and needs to be replaced, but also, um, when the facility was fully assessed, it was determined that some areas of the pool didn't meet ADA slope standards. And so some of that deck area has to be replaced because of that. So I think 80 to 90% of the deck is going to be replaced. So that, that adds another, you know, element. That's a lot of concrete deck and it's a, it's a, it's a complicated cantilever deck that, that, that laps over the, the edge of the pool. And so, um, it's going to be all the concrete work's going to be done first 
which is includes around the main lap pool so that um, maybe when the high school swim season starts in February, if everything goes to plan, we will once the contractor is, is selected, we can have a conversation about the scheduling that maybe we can open up the lap pool only to bring programs back while they're still finishing that south side where this project's going to be. So All right. that's my answer. <laughs> and you, you won't be here for it, but much more importantly, are we planning a pool party for when it's open? Absolutely. OK, good. Absolutely. Um, Good stuff. I have a question. Sure, go ahead. Uh, you, you talked about you know the availability for people to use the facility. How, how are you managing that? Is it a lottery system? Use of you mean the, when everyone has to use Ridgeway? Yeah. So um, obviously some programming like lap swim, having two pools, you might end up where they go to Ridgeway and they can have one person a lane or maybe two people a lane, uh, and occasionally. You know, circle swim. So we anticipate that when lap swimmers have to move over, there's going to be a little bit more circle swimming for for most swimmers. They're used to doing that. Uh, hopefully, it doesn't get too busy. But then we're looking at expanding beyond our one o'clock time into the early afternoon and add more times to try and spread out those numbers. So I think I think I, I feel confident the lap swimmers are going to be accommodated. There may be just times where oh, I, I never can get a lane to myself anymore. Well, you know, we have we have the widest lanes in the county. If you compare them to other pools, we've got the widest they can be built. So it's easy for two swimmers and easy to circle swim in our, in our lane. So water fitness, um, we're not going to be able to accommodate every water fitness time. But even talking to uh, mostly the the ladies that are the regulars in that class, I should be sexy, the, the, the participants that are the regulars, um, they're going, well, I think during that time, I'm going to go to the Y or this other pool uh, because I really needed to be 83 or 84 degrees. So, um, so we're not going to make everyone happy, but we're going to do the best we can. Uh, obviously, uh, with having a, this pool closed, we'll have an extra coordinator, an extra specialist that's going to be able to help with customer service and helping to helping to make the patrons happy. So. Um, but I haven't stopped conversation with the JC and their beautiful pool there. And, and I was even having conversation with Wiki up, although we are going, this project is going to be in the winter months. So we're not going to be having the issues with the fair weather swimmers that we usually get in the spring and summer. So there's not as big a number. So um, hopefully that answers your question. Thank you, it does. Thank you so much. One more. Go ahead, Kelly. Yeah, is um, I know during COVID, uh, lap uh, swim was being scheduled online. Are participants still scheduling their time? No, we're, we're back, to back to first come, first serve. It, yeah, it's it's a, completely back to our normal uh, drop in programming uh, where uh, we have our lane lines designated by fast, medium, slow, or walking lane. And so they come out, and the lifeguard will help, find, help them find the right lane for their needs. So it's completely a drop-in program. You know, sometimes people come in and go, oh, it's a little busy for me today. I'll come back tomorrow or later. Or, you know, so it's completely a drop-in. I suggest that might need review when um, this pool gets closed. I don't know how effective the scheduling online was. I know that, <laughs> excuse me, some older people were having challenges yeah. uh, booking a lane before they were all booked up. But and we had that busy. Yeah, we had that scheduling primarily that we to start with, we had one person a lane, and then we went to two people a lane. As soon as we went back to more than two people a lane, we went back to our drop-in system where they can uh, have the lane to themselves or split a lane or circle swim if it's three or more. So, but yeah, we're going to have further conversation and do a lot more, uh, put a lot more thought into it before we uh, close, close Finley. Yeah. Thank you. One last question for you, Don, before we go to the public comment. What is the state agency that inspects the spray ground that you said? So uh, any any pools, any commercial pools, so that includes uh, homeowners associations, hotel pools, anything that's, uh, you know, uh, uh, fitness clubs uh, are subject to the county health standards. And now there is an actual California health standards that governs uh, 
pool construction and pool operation that's uh, that's been implemented by the county. So we get inspected several times a year at each facility for um, the permitting of the pools and also the permitting of our concession stands for food handling. And then we also are subject to um, the state, like I said, for the slide amusement ride. Yeah. And then what was the name of that agency? Uh, tramway amusement ride. Okay. Because uh, it also that's the same agency that inspects the train and carousel out at the uh, Howarth Park. Same. Right. Sometimes that's the same. That's the same inspector. I've heard of that one. <laughs> yeah. So they want to make sure it's very safe for participants. Great. Um, we have to go through a very strict, you know, operating procedure for, and the slide is considered an amusement ride. Yeah. Um, and then we also have to uh, meet standards, uh, SIRS, through the uh, state fire marshal and our fire department are getting inspected for hazmat uh, procedures and hazmat uh, storage of chemicals. And so they do a inspection and certify us to be, to be safe uh, for chemical operation and chemical, chemical storage. So. Okay. Unfortunately, we've got some really good staff that are going to continue that when I'm gone. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think those are all our comments, so thank you. Right. And uh, we'll bring in our public comment now. Dwayne, do you have a public comment? Yes, thank you. What an interesting and informative presentation. Thank you so much, sir. My name is Dwayne DeWitt. I'm from Rosalind. <coughs> and 60 years ago, I took my swim lessons at Ridgeway Pool. Did you, I love that pool. Yeah, I'm still doing it, bro. <laughs> but the thing about Ridgeway is, you know, they took out the diving boards, which I loved. That's where Santa Rosa High School students used the pool for their swim teams back in the day, right? He mentioned the need for more pool space. And there's a discussion going on with the city of Santa Rosa to develop in the Bellevue district to the south of Hearn Avenue, a site that they're calling a Hearn Community Hub. And since L.C. Allen High School was built in 1994, they've talked about, we need a pool out here. And we tried to get it at Southwest Community Park when we had that project area committee back in the day. So I'm hoping that you folks will point out that we need a really nice pool, not just a small, small one. Here's an example I'd like you to look at, perhaps. Helsinki, Finland, they hosted the Olympics in the past. They kept the pool afterwards, and it's a municipal pool now. It's a beautiful setup. Look into things like that, and let's dream really big for the kids of the future to have the best pools they could have. When I was young, Ridgeway Pool was dynamite. You're like, man, this is great. We got all these pools, right? But obviously, the city's going to grow to, they want it to grow over a quarter of a million people. So if that's going to happen, we need to have more pools and really nice big ones. And that whole, annexation that's going to happen with uh, the urban sprawl out to Moreland and go all the way down to Todd and, and bring that stuff in. All those people are going to need a really nice pool. So I'm here to tell you, start looking for those really big, nice ones with diving boards and all the good stuff, man, so that the kids can really get going on it. And uh, I think we'll have a wonderful time. We'll actually have the, uh, oh, those private group, the nauticals or the Neptune swim team? The Neptune swim team. They had a dive team in the past too. And some of them were trying out for the Olympics, I was told. So we could get back to that and then have our <coughs> Santa Rosa kids be in that situation. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your comments. All right. Do we have any other discussion from the board on that agenda item? Any comments? No? All right. Don, thank you for your service to the city and for your presentation. And we have Jeff approaching. I just wanted to make one final comment. Um, thank you, Jen, for mentioning it earlier. But when Don proposed, hey, what about a, this isn't your ordinary backyard pool proposal? Um, hopefully you enjoy it. I was like, yeah, that's interesting. And you know, the savings of money and energy and all those different things. But also what I was really excited about it for kind of Don's last presentation here is it was really a great snapshot, even for me sitting in the audience of how much knowledge and wisdom and experience that we're losing. Um, but also what I've gotten to see, and I hope everyone takes assurance in, is how amazing of a mentor that Don is. Um, and he truly has not even just those um, who are from aquatics currently, but aquatics, Don, what's your mission? Aquatics is gonna take over the world. Um, they, they've done a really good job in recreation and parks. And so he's got his team here that is his current aquatics team, but the entire recreation team um, has been 
uh, positively impacted and mentored through through Don's time with us. And it's a very complicated. There's a lot to it. Um, and Don has done an amazing job managing it for 25 years now. Um, but he's done an even better job of setting us up to succeed after he retires. So um, thank you again, Jen, for bringing it up. But I wanted to uh, kind of cap off that presentation as Don's last presentation to the board um, and thank him once again from, from all of Recreation and Parks for all the work. Thanks, Don. Thank you again, Don. Maybe we'll see you at the pool party next year. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, oh, wait, oh, yeah. yeah. My Hawaiian shorts, my straw hat. There you go. You did outlast the chlorine generator. I was paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that wasn't so pretty. Touching, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I was touching guys. All right, thank you. Uh, so now we'll move on to our next item, 8.2, the Measure M Parks Expenditure Plan Update. Uh, we have our Parks Planner, Scott Wilkinson, and our Parks Maintenance Superintendent, James Castro, who will present and uh, update us regarding the Measure M Plan for capital and maintenance projects. Step on up, Scott, or James, who's ever going first? I'm going to go first okay. here. Thank you, Chair Pitts, Vice Chair Castillo, and the rest of the board here at the Board of Community Services. Uh, uh, thank you for having me. Um, I told you I'd be back uh, last time, and here I am. So it's great to see you all again, and great to be here. Um, yes, I uh, am here with James Castro. Uh, well, first of all, I am Scott Wilkinson, the Park Planner with the City of Santa Rosa. Um, and I'm here with James Castro, Maintenance Supervisor. I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview about uh, the Measure M uh, uh, program as a whole, uh, and then cover a little bit of the uh, capital uh, side, the direction we're going in terms of funding some of the capital improvement projects that we have in the department. And James is going to talk about um, the expenditures related to um, the maintenance programming that um, we have going in the department. Um, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions and comments at the at the end of the presentation here. So next slide, please. Um, as many of you know, the measure is a, is a 10 year uh, a measure that started in uh, 2019 and it's going to run through the year of uh, 20 um, or the spring of 2029. Uh, it's structured so that 50% um, of the uh, the money collected through the, the, the program is allocated to the Sonoma County Regional Parks Department and 50% to the nine cities, um, incorporated cities in the, in the county. Um, the city of Santa Rosa, uh, the projection is uh, that the city of Santa Rosa will receive approximately 1.9 or just under $2 million per year uh, to allocate uh, to the parks uh, department as a whole, including um, maintenance, capital projects, maintenance, and recreation program um, and aquatics. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, next slide, please. Um, so far, uh, the department has allocated approximately four million dollars, um, and that in the first couple of years, first two years, that has funded um, an extensive community uh, public outreach process that's well documented in um, the parks, Measure and Parks for All public input report, which I'm sure many of you have seen. If not, all the wealth of information that was collected there through uh, numerous community meetings um, is well documented in this report in, in, in the attachments therein. Um, at the website that is listed at the bottom of this slide that you have in your, your packet as well. As well. So I encourage you to um, go there and, um, and enjoy all the comments and input that we had uh, collected through that process. Um, the money also funded a um, in-depth assessment of, uh, of all of our uh, park facilities. Um, those of you who have been on the board for more than a year or so are intimately familiar with that and have seen seen that um, evolve and 
come to fruition and has really informed the process that we're getting into now in terms of how, how we want to allocate the money going forward to improve our, our facilities um, throughout the department. It has also funded um, uh, repair to parks that were damaged in the fire, uh, parks and both parks and land and uh, roadside landscapes are being um, improved and, and repaired through this funding as well as um, the funding of a maintenance, um, volunteer maintenance supply trailer, uh, tools, and uh, as well as staffing that's really increased our capacity um, to help care for and plan for uh, improvements to, to the parks to better serve uh, the recreational needs of our community. So, uh, next slide, please. So one of the big um, takeaways from the uh, initial outreach was uh, really kind of creating a framework for how that money was going to be spent. Um, and that was uh, that, you know, a large part of the input uh, led to um, the idea of really taking care of the parks that we have, really Im improving, um, investing in, 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 in some of the deferred maintenance projects. Um, creating new facilities at existing parks to uh, upgrade existing parks and on the, in terms of capital improvements. Um, so 50% of the money is, going, is being allocated in that direction. Um, similarly, uh, maintenance and uh, 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 is also important and uh, developing the deferred maintenance uh, projects that we've needed to uh, get to uh, is the other 40% and then 10% for the recreation programming to expand recreation programming throughout the city. Uh, um, not just aquatics, but in other areas as well. Uh, beyond that, in terms of the capital um, improvements, which I'd like to focus on uh, for a few minutes before I turn it over to James, there are really kind of four priority areas that came out of the work, both the um, community outreach and the assessment uh, project uh, report. Um, and those were uh, play areas, improvements to play areas, um, sports fields, improvements to sports fields, sport courts, and finally, uh, safety and accessibility issues in general throughout, throughout our facilities. So next slide, please. Play areas, um, just running through a, a couple of these, these different areas. Here are a few images of some of the older play um, areas and play equipment that um, we're planning to upgrade and, and use the Measure M funds to upgrade in the coming years. Uh, next slide, please. Sports fields, both soccer and uh, baseball softball fields that are in need of, of upgrades, both um, on the sort of capital improvement side and also uh, uh, on the ongoing maintenance side of things as well. This is a field at Jacobs Park on the left. Um, middle shot is of the soccer field at Southwest Community Park and the um, field at Jennings Park to the far right. Next slide, please. Sport courts, as I mentioned, um, those include basketball courts, tennis courts, and um, everyone's favorite pickleball courts, which we're um, hoping to um, create uh, some of those going forward as well as um, it's a super popular and growing sport in our community um, and elsewhere. Um, on the left is a basketball court at South Davis Neighborhood Park, uh, Power Park tennis courts that we're going to be renovating and uh, the basketball court at Tanglewood Park there, for example. Next slide, please. In terms of safety and accessibility, um, we're gonna be looking at improvements to park pathways, paved and unpaved trails, as well as replacing park amenities and furnishings throughout uh, some of these facilities. Um, and, and that dovetails with some of what James will cover in, in a minute. Um, this is a shot in the upper right of Newhall um, Trail Park that um, connects Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Park to uh, Petaluma Hill Boulevard. It's about a quarter mile 
Trail there, um, and then Vet Vietnam Veterans Memorial Trail that's um, adjacent to Spring Lake and, and Annadale Park. So next slide, please. So as I spoke uh, about last time when we went over the um, park development impact fee and um, program and how those funds are allocated to the different areas of the city, um, it's also helpful to kind of look at the different quadrants of the city in terms of organizing how we're going to invest these uh, Measure M funds in our parks throughout the different the four different um, quadrants. So in the following slides, we're just going to go over um, some of the priority projects that we've identified in each of these quadrants. Next slide, please. And in your um, attachments, there are a list of these projects that are grouped by project type. Um, but for this um, presentation, I've, we've put them into, um, like I said, into the, the organized by the, the quadrants. So quadrant one is, is the Northwest quadrant. And we're looking at um, the prior, priority projects there in green, uh, play area and field renovations at Jacobs Neighborhood Park, play area and field renovations at Live Oak Neighborhood Park, and sports field renovations at Jennings Neighborhood Park. Um, totaling, uh, and these are based on really early estimates um, so that we can just kind of begin to organize uh, how much we can do with the projected amount of funds, which may change over time slightly, but it's, it's, a good, it's a really good starting place in terms of us thinking through what some of these projects are gonna actually cost and how much we, 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 we think we can accomplish with um, the available funds in, 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 in each quadrant of the city. Um, you'll see the future projects down below are, uh, are, are the sort of the next tier of, uh, of ranking in, in terms of projects that we would get to given additional funding that uh, comes available um, throughout the program, the life of the program. Um, next slide, please. Quadrant two, we have uh, identified um, $3.3 million in funding for this quadrant, and that would be going towards um, three principal projects um, at this point. Cook Middle or Cook School Park, play area renovation there, uh, basketball court replacement and upgrade at South Davis Neighborhood Park, and soccer field renovation uh, project at Southwest Community Park. Next slide, please. Quadrant three, um, two projects identified in this quadrant, Rincon Valley Community Park, uh, significant play area renovation there, um, and a basketball court replacement project at Tanglewood Neighborhood Park. Um, together, those are early estimates are, are, are for $1.6 million. And you can see future projects Projects um, next level of priority: Doyle Park ball field renovation, Franklin Community Park ball field renovation, and uh, the possibility of creating a play area at Courthouse Square as another uh, idea. Next slide, please. Quadrant four uh, projects we have identified uh, are a play area renovation at Peter Springs Neighborhood Park tennis court renovations at Howarth Community Park and tennis court renovations at Galvin Community Park. And you can see a host of other future possibilities, no shortage of uh, projects available to do um, given um, the uh, inflow of additional funding. So with that, I'd like to kick it over to James to cover um, the park maintenance aspects in the next couple of slides. Thanks, uh, change the slides. Chair Pitts, Vice Chair Castillo, board members, my name is James Castro. I'm the superintendent that oversees park maintenance. So we've got a couple of slides here for you on park maintenance. And I, I really wanna mention that one of the guiding tools for us was that in maintenance, this was not meant to supplant the services that 
we're supposed to do as an agency. <clears throat> in maintenance, that's a little difficult to accomplish because if you can imagine, we've been unfunded in a lot of areas for many years. And so we're looking at deferred maintenance situations that we're trying to get ourselves out of. And some of the strategies that we're coming up with, we're looking for guidance from you guys. So this is short term. Hopefully this is within the next year. Um, but the first thing we have um, are additional staffing for the months of April through September. A lot happens in parks during these months, right? Some sun comes out, the weeds are all over the city. We have the summer camps, we have our sports fields. And just the amount of people that are in our parks at one time is, is actually really, really encouraging. But we, we need some additional help during the summer. Um, so summer camps, sports fields, weed abatement, we put a cost on that um, to address those things. Uh, benches in Courthouse Square, we're looking at replacing 30 damaged benches in Courthouse Square. The original design was kind of poor and the quality of benches that were put in Courthouse Square have actually become somewhat of a safety issue. So we're going to replace them with newer designs that are more durable and we've been working with the downtown folks and the DAO to try to come up with the right design on that. The sand for the volleyball courts, currently the grit sand that is in the volleyball courts is, is not to the standard. But this is again one of those issues that we've been unfunded for for years. They're, they are using the courts. There's actually a volleyball team out there right now using them. But we're going to put the, the right sand in there so that the amenity is more playable. Um, park a month. I, I can't say enough about park a month. It, it has taken off. We're very, very happy with our turnout and um, the community involvement. Most of you here have, have participated in those. So we're, uh, we're really happy with how things are going. And we've, we've put a cost on it, and, and that cost is around the personal protective equipment that we offer to all the volunteers that show up. And you know, this started post-COVID, and there was, you know, we're not, we're not taking the gloves back, right? We're giving you the gloves and, and go on and use them. So in our short-term uh, plan here, we're looking at about $240,000 of our money that we're going to be spending. So next slide, please. <clears throat> and then this is more of our long, long term plan and we're still strategizing to figure out the right way to do this. But, you know, we heard from the, the community and we heard, you know, it's not just the community that we hear from our, our staff has a lot of input on the, the improvements that need to happen around the parks. So irrigation controllers were a big one, right, because sports fields, we still in Santa Rosa don't have a sports complex. And so we really need to be investing more into our fields that we have. So that comes in the form of irrigation controllers. We don't have remote access right now. We have to manually go out and turn things on and turn things off. It's not to say we have no remote access. We do have some remote access. So we're working with companies to get some bids on what it would be to be able to control all of our irrigation systems across the city remotely. If we get an alarm, something breaks, we'll know immediately and be able to turn it off. Rehabbing our turf, that number there is based on city staff rehabbing our turf. Um, the conditions of our fields fluctuate from city staff being able to do it versus it needing to be a capital improvement. So as many of you know, Parks and Rec were separated for a minute and now we're back and so we're able to strategize with capital improvements to come up with the right plan that will accommodate not only park maintenance but our whole Rec and Park team. And then vandal proof, vandal proof storage containers. This is an idea we're floating around because at most of our sports fields, we have little sheds that have some equipment for the sports, some equipment for park maintenance, but they get broken into constantly. So we will be, again, strategizing with recreation to find where we can put these containers. And they're just mini Connex boxes and they'll be able to lock them up and nobody will be able to get into them. So as far as the irrigation controllers, we're working with our water use efficiency team and we're hoping to put things in line to put things to align with our climate action plan. Um, so more to come on that. And then the restroom remodel. This is a, a touchy subject. Uh, technically parks doesn't own the restrooms. They're owned by our facility maintenance crew. And we are hoping to partner with them to have all of our restrooms in our parks remodeled. I have three daughters. I know what it's like to be in a park and the park bathrooms are, they're embarrassing to be honest. So we're hoping to throw some money at that. Uh, new paint, new fixtures, new flooring. We'll have to do some ADA upgrades um, in order to 
me code, uh, but that's the goal. So long term, this this slide totals to about 1.3 million, and that's all I have for you. I'm gonna turn it back over to Scott. Thanks, James. So um, just wanted to go over some of the um, next steps before we open it up to you all to um, provide any comments that you have, comments and questions that you have on anything we've talked about here. But um, we will then incorporate those comments and that feedback and um, um, develop, further refine our, uh, our plan going forward in terms of the, the capital improvement side and the, and the maintenance investments. Um, that we, we'd like to make both in the short term and the long term. Um, City Council will uh, then provide their approval via the uh, budget ad adoption, um, and we'll continue to work on project scheduling and developing work plans to accomplish the, the work at hand um, and continue to provide quarterly updates at the Citizen Oversight Committee, um, the Measure M Citizen Oversight Committee. Um, uh, that we do regularly going forward and will continue to do throughout the life of the, um, the measure, the 10 years of the measure. So with that, uh, that concludes the presentation for this evening and uh, I'd like to hear from you. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, James. We have questions from board members. Go ahead, Omar. Um, so you very briefly touched on the tennis courts being repaired at Howarth Park. I've had some inquiries from the public on it, so can I ask you a little bit more about the timeline, budgeting, that kind of stuff on it? Yeah, so we we are creating a, a, a scope in terms of um, what it's going to take to replace um, the courts out there that have fallen into disrepair. And we are hopeful that that is a project that we can get underway um, ne next next year. So just there's no current timeline specifically. We don't have a current timeline yeah, for that. Mm -hmm. Anything else over? I think not at this point. Carol, go ahead. So to me, $2 million is a lot of money. Um, for the city of Santa Rosa, it's not a lot of money. And maybe for Parks and Rec, while it's nice money, uh, could you give some perspective for what the $1 million a year for capital improvements is in the capital improvements budget and the 800,000 for maintenance, what percentage of the maintenance, put it in real terms. So I can say, oh, this is this much extra. Uh, I, I'm having a hard time visualizing it. Visualizing what uh, $1 million could could afford or no what what an additional one million dollars to the capital improvement budget that the parks department has in a year what percentage is one million dollars is it a ten percent bump is it a five percent bump oh the increase I see I understand your question um, I'm going to ask Jen if if you could address this sure I I'm, I'm, I'm happy to so um, you'll remember that slide where we had the quadrants. And so every year, the amount of funds we receive for park development impact fees is based on the residential uh, units that are built in each of those quadrants. So it fluctuates greatly from year to year. So you never really know. Um, one year we could get as low as 40,000, which is low for um, capital projects and, and residential. The next year we could get 3 million in the same quadrant. So it's really, it's really all over the place. It's hard to narrow it down. Over the years, we kind of generalize and average it to about one and a half to two million dollars. So this is a this is a nice and significant improvement to uh, the capital projects budget. And we really hope to you could see that it's a lot of projects, but it's not nearly the projects that are in our condition assessment. So we're really hoping to extend this measure into the future to really provide that extra needed effort uh, for not only the deferred maintenance, uh, the staff members are mentioning some of the things that aren't funded yet, some of that and uh, additional capital funds that that park development funds don't really cover a lot of that. So, I, you know, possibly, um, you know, I don't know, I don't know about in, uh, percentages, but at least 10 to 20% more each year for each quadrant. So it's uh, for each, for the city each year. 
Okay. So yeah. Okay. It's a good. It's a good amount of money. <laughs> you know the percentage for park maintenance. And I'll, I'll James chime in. I I don't know for park maintenance for sure because park maintenance has never had funding for these kind of deferred maintenance projects ever. So it's a one hundred percent increase for park maintenance. Uh, and as far as staffing, we have eight, we have about twenty five right now. So twenty three. So we'll have eight additional or four additional staff that we wouldn't normally have. And we're going to see how it goes. So it's a nice, it's a smaller increase on staffing level and a one hundred percent increase on. Capital on Did the I just hear you say we're getting four additional park maintenance workers? We temporary groundskeepers. We are fantastic. Yeah, yeah, super exciting. Anything else? <laughs> okay. Any other questions from the board? Oh, I'm sorry. I unfortunately wasn't quite done. Um, there seemed to be some overlap between park maintenance <laughs> money outlay and capital improvements. I'm a little fuzzy on why. Bench replacement is park maintenance, but a playground replacement is a capital improvement. Can someone clarify that for me? I'll defer that to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, y'all. I'll, I'll do my best. It is a gray area. It is a gray area, but once your project exceeds a certain amount, we have a, a certain amount of budget for park maintenance to replace uh, broken things. And um, when something needs to be completely replaced. So they'll replace pieces of our playground equipment, but not the whole thing. So when the whole thing needs to be replaced or we need 50 new benches at um, at Courthouse Square or something, you know, I don't know how many it is, but then that uh, that's when it becomes a capital project. So it's a bigger investment on the space part as well as bigger coordination for uh, the design and community engagement. Uh, if it's park maintenance, more like, okay, let's just replace that bench, you know, it got damaged somehow. So that's more of the more in line with park maintenance. If that if that helps, if it can be repaired easily within the budget we have for park maintenance, uh, we usually address it right away. If it needs capital improvement, community engagement, then we involve our park planning team. And I have one more question. I'm hoping for an illustration. Um, South Davis Park. We've been talking about it a goodly amount. You were used uh, used it as an example for Measure M funding for the basketball court. Yeah. I know that there was a grant received for the um, play structure. Is there capital improvement money from the regular? If you could use it as an example for these different components working together, it would help me visualize these different funding sources. Because as I remember, the Measure M was supposed to be the enhancement and the um, I was voting to make my parks better not to maintain them as they were so i think this would interest the public in knowing this yeah a couple things there i think um so we do have a variety of different funding sources at play oftentimes at, at one one park facility you mentioned south davis park we have a, um, a lot going on there we have a, a, a recently gone through a whole master planning pro process there and we have a phase one of that master plan project uh, underway, uh, the design work underway for it, which is a significant replacement and renovation of the play area there on the um, north end of that, of that park. Um, the basketball court in the middle is not part of that project, that first phase of work that is being funded through a, a grant program through the state. Um, the basketball court, through the conditions assessment uh, report, uh, ranked high in, in that category of project types of things that we wanted to replace. Um, it's basically the end of an old road that uh, doesn't go through anymore or, or was terminated when the highway was built there. And so we're interested in a, an upgrade there that would, would make it more a part of the park, raise the level of it up so that it's continuous with the grade of the, the park itself and feels more like a proper basketball court than a road bed. So what I'm hearing you say is there's the grant money for the play structure. There's the measure M money for the basketball court. Any regular budget money for South Davis Park or it's the measure M and the grant? Those are the, the two significant 
Yeah, we, we do have uh, matching right. funds from our park development impact fees when we applied for the grant. So it's half uh, city uh, park development, half the grant. And then, so that's that project. It's on a fast timeline. Uh, but like Scott said, this basketball court is, is raised uh, to the to the level of needing replacement. So that'll be phase two and that's entirely measure M. But yeah. what I'm hearing you say is there is regular budget money mm -hmm. going. I didn't know that. And that is so good to hear that fills in a missing piece. Sorry. Right. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jen. Sorry. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? I've got a quick question on the, the benches at Courthouse Square. Are those the metal ones? That need replacing? Yes. All right. Well, <laughs> if there's any design for those, I'm, the like armrests you're supposed to have in there, those don't seem very comfortable at all. So if you could <laughs> redesign those, I don't know. I don't know what the process is for that. But yeah, you want to speak I'll, to that? I'll comment on that. <laughs> yeah. That is by design. We don't want them to be comfortable for people to sleep on. So uh, the armrests were put in there intentionally to defer people from hanging out for too long. And that is at the direction of the downtown association. Oh, okay, that was their call. All right. Well, fair enough on that one. Oh. <laughs> no napping in Courthouse Square. For yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, people like to take naps down. There's a lot, of, there's a lot of gentlemen down there taking naps. So. Uh, any other questions? Sorry to interrupt you. No, that was it. Uh, perhaps 10% uh, of the benches could be comfortable in the next time. Well, absolutely. And we are looking at. Um, you know, re the replacements and the design of the replacements, and there may be a combination of different styles as well. I had some, thank you. I had some questions on the benches too, actually. Um, if you're all done, Paul. <laughs> that's all I got. No, that's, I was wondering too. Um, are those the picnic benches with the tables or just the seated, the sitting ones? Just the freestanding benches. That's correct, initially. Okay. Yeah. I also support more comfortable benches. So I, I second that. To be comfortable, all people. Um, yeah, a uh, couple questions. Um, that was one. Um, the play area in Courthouse Square, where is that? Going to be? Do you, do you have an idea yet? Um, the, in concept, it would it would be um, potentially on the um, in sort of the uh, southeast air corner of the of the plaza. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's pretty early stages in terms of the the site design. And, and what would that be next layout. to? What would it be next to? Yeah. Um, be like Third Street side. Third Street side, yeah, and the bank building over there um, where the, the grove of trees are, but it is um, still to be determined exactly, you know, the size and how it would fit and what it would look like, so, yeah. Okay, thank you. A um, few other questions. Uh, the, uh, these are for James, I think. Um, so you said that the facilities maintenance crews are responsible for the bathrooms. Can you kind of explain how that breaks down, James? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So facility maintenance is in charge of 109 city owned general fund buildings around the city, not including um, all the water departments. So even the little kiosks, or that's what we call them in facilities in Courthouse Square, are considered under the purview of facility maintenance. My understanding is that in order for a park to actually have ownership of the facilities in the park, it was to become a district, and that would create a whole nother funding source around it. So facility maintenance has a very short budget, uh, they call it their park ancillary budget, to take care of the parks. Park maintenance goes and opens them, and cleans them, but anything that goes wrong with the shell of the building, any plumbing, any roof, any outside of the building, we call it facility maintenance and they take care of it. Okay. They have a construction crew and, you know, we, we do our best to maintain the buildings, you know, toilet clocks, staff will try, but ultimately that would be facility maintenance responsibility. Okay. Um, that's interesting. Is that, so they just have like the right, well, I guess you said there might be a legal reason, but is it also that they have like the right training or equipment or what just. No, nope, this is just the bureaucracy of the city. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's interesting. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, Cause I do get complaints all the time. So as you said, we all use the parks and which is why we're trying to come forward and say, Hey, if it has to be parks money, 
that's the <laughs> because these are a major amenity in our park and they need a serious <laughs> upgrade. And you, yeah, absolutely. But you did say that your crews can clean them, just like a normal <laughs> sort of cleaning. It is our our crew's responsibility to clean them. Yes. Okay. I do have a quick question. <coughs> is that something uh, unique to Santa Rosa? Is that something you see in other jurisdictions? I don't know. I, I go ahead, Jen. I'll... Yeah, it's definitely not unique to this city whatsoever. Um, smaller cities often turn everything into public works or into certain groups for efficiency standards. And uh, years ago it was decided, um, the question came up, why is facilities not maintaining the buildings within the parks? And so these were added. They have a budget to do that. We don't maintain that budget. We maintain the maintenance of the interior, the day-to-day -day cleaning, stuff like that. So not unusual, not entirely unusual. So we, we work it out. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. What what department is facilities maintenance under? Public Works. Yeah. Currently, they're in TPW. Okay. Okay. Public Works. All right. Thank you for that breakdown. Um, so, uh, so one, and then I think that was oh one little question. I was because I was at Bicentennial Park. There was some construction there, but I think Scott said it's not. It's in the future, but it looked like something going on. Are you? rebuilding that play structure or? Yeah, so where that construction is taking place, there was an old gazebo, there was a, um, two horseshoe pits, and a couple of barbecues and really aged seating uh, furniture. Okay. So uh, we worked with capital improvements and decided we we're gonna tear it all out and redesign something. Uh, we had a, a really big homeless population that continues to be an issue there. Um, and they basically had the overhang and a fence around it so they could really just set up shop and it was it was completely deteriorated so we we made the call to remove it okay is there any what's what's going to go there do you have anything in mind yet we have a couple preliminary ideas a dog park has been thrown around a community garden has been thrown around but we're still again going through what what would the community want there so nothing has been decided yet okay thanks um i think that was all my questions any other last questions from the board, Carol? This is more a comment. As these improvements happen, I highly encourage signage that say your measure M dollars at work. People think of Caltrans and it's like, oh, something does happen. Especially at individual neighborhood parks, people can feel good about this. And I think it's a, a good reflection on the department to tout the improvements so that park users can see that. Absolutely. Their dollars at work. There's some required signage, so we will absolutely, we're looking forward to placing that out there. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Carol. Um, all right. Those are all questions from the board. We will go to public comment on this. Thank you, sir. I'd like to make a comment. <clears throat> go ahead, Dwayne. Thank you. <clears throat> Dwayne DeWitt from Roseland. Very informative and uh, a good thing to hear today. When Measure M was going forward, Brett Wilkinson came out into Roseland and solicited people to be supportive of Measure M to make sure that uh, this wouldn't fail. And actually on their materials from the election, Roseland has called out that there would be funding shared with Roseland. I bring this up because I had never supported a tax increase in my entire life until this one. And I said, okay, we're gonna do this because Roseland stuff's coming in. So the one park in Roseland is South Davis that's being addressed. There are people who live nearby there who would like to see it renamed to George Maybe Park in honor of World War II Pearl Harbor casualty, George Maybe, who died on the USS Arizona, who lived across the street from where that park is now located. They put those comments in to the master plan update, and we are hoping that someone will act upon that. I, uh, when I was young, was over there a lot because for a while uh, I lived at uh, 215 Teresa Street and I knew this park really well. It is something that is a very helpful thing to have. And the comments that were coming up today reminded me of something that's very important that's been overlooked. There was a Santa Rosa Youth Athletic Field Trust set up over 25 years ago to help be funding for place to play here on West Third Street. And that structure is probably still in place, but the people who were involved 
they would have gone off to retirement and things like that. City council member and former mayor Jane Bender was involved, people like that. I think there should be a focus from staff here to reach out and make sure that we can get more volunteer activity, reactivate the athletic field trust and find ways to get more things at Southwest Community Park, which is in the Bellevue district, but is used by many people from Roseland. Um, people have set up ad hoc volleyball court there and people are basically uh, running basketball uh, tournaments. It's a really great thing to see. There's a lot of use at Southwest Community Park. We'd like to see two more basketball fields just to the north of the existing fields, put in the volleyball courts there, and then go for more soccer fields also at Southwest Community Park. Now, there's one thing there that people say is a holdback, and that's because there was a spot put aside for California Tiger Salamander, but I believe they're all dead there. So you should probably check and make sure if there's any living there, then you got to worry about it. But if they're all dead, take that space and put it to use. All right. And basically Southwest Community Parks can get a lot of use from all this new building coming in. Thank you kindly for your help. Thank you, Dwayne. All right. Uh, with that, uh, we will go to any discussion items on 8.2. Any last thoughts from any board members? All right, I'll, I'll share a few. Um, I did notice the picture of Peter Springs Park, so thank you for that. I bugged Jen a few times on that one. Um, the play structure, I think, is older than me. So, um, and I appreciated the breakdown, James, of all the numbers for each park. Thanks for that. I like to always love that level of detail. And while I have you, I will let you know I brought up the Arborist with Councilmember Rogers. So, um, we're working on it. Trying to get an Arborist? Yeah, um, rehiring an arborist. So, uh, and then my last comment, and I've said this before, so I'll just be brief. Measure M is super important, um, and I just love that forty percent of it goes to maintenance. We don't often do that in government. We like building shiny new things, uh, and then we often don't maintain them. So I'm really glad you're getting those funds. Um, it's super important, and it's super important to renewing that sales tax. That's what we want to do when it expires. Um, so with that, uh, I'll end my comments. And I just want to thank you again for your presentation. Thank you to you both. All right, we are moving on now to item nine. Uh, that's me up first, 9.1, the mayor's lunch for committee board chairs. Unfortunately, we still have not had that lunch. So I cannot provide a report because uh, I haven't done it yet. Um, hoping that we'll start those up again. Um, and item 9.2, Board Member Quant, would you please provide us an update for the Waterways Committee? There was no meeting last month. The next meeting will hopefully have a field trip to Colgan Creek Reach Future Park. Uh, unfortunately, we did not meet quorum for tomorrow, so that will be moved to another month. Great. Thanks for continuing to serve on that, Carol. Uh, Dwayne, do you have a comment on that one? I was curious. She just said there's no quorum, so there's no walk on Colton Creek tomorrow. That's correct, and that has been posted. Thank you kindly for that. Was that your comment, Dwayne? <clears throat> uh, that's what I wanted to find out. Okay, yes, thank I you. I appreciate that, sir. Um, and that is now we're on to item 10, Deputy Director Santos. Uh, do we have any written or electronic communications? We have not received any written or electronic communications. Okay, great. Uh, item 11, future agenda items. Is there anything specific that any board members would like to see on a future agenda? No? Okay. Um, the only, I believe you did say in May, we're gonna talk about the ordinance update. So that was the only one from me. And with that, we will get to number 12, the adjournment. So the next regularly scheduled meeting of the Board of Community Services will be held on Wednesday, uh, this is not, not the right date here. Um, I help me out. It's going to be, my apologies, May, right. May 24th. Okay, Wednesday, May 24th, still at 4 p.m., still in this room. Um, and I hope to see you all then and, and some more members of the public, possibly. So with that, I adjourn this uh, meeting of the Board of Community Services at 5.05 p.m. Thank you. Thank you.
triplets. Uh, I can just.